Welcome everybody to the Finance and Administration Committee today. We'd like to have the approval of the minutes, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. Approval of minutes. All in favor? All right. All right. Chairs are aye. Minutes are approved as presented. We're going to make a little adjustment on our agenda today. We are first we're going to have an interview by two potential candidates for the CHHS. And is Casey in the room or on? Right oh, here, yes. Yeah, Casey. Come on down, please. That's right. <laughs> Come on down. We have no prizes except a lot of volunteer work for you. That's right. <laughs> So you have submitted your application to serve on the CHHS board. Do you want to give us a little bit about yourself? Certainly. I am a Spokane replant. Ooh. I grew up elementary and middle school here and moved away when I was in high school with my family to the west side of the state where I lived for 40 plus years, high school, college, university, career, raised my children. And then about two and a half years ago, my husband started looking around and uh, thought Spokane was a nice place to check out maybe retiring in a few years. So he applied for a job and we moved back almost exactly two years ago. So I spent most of my adult career as a school administrator, elementary level for 18 years, working in our community. It was a small-ish rural community that served about 10,000 kids. It grew over time. And I've served on boards both for United Way of Snohomish County for many mm -hmm. years. And then um, one of my alma maters, Seattle Pacific University, served as a board member for the Public Education Advisory Board School of Counseling. So try to stay connected and keep finding myself with mm -hmm. families and community and homes and services to help strengthen and support the people that we live around. Great, thank you. Any questions for Casey? Councilmember Stratton. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So I just spent um, a lovely day last week. I spent the morning at a local high school just um, at a, during a class time talking about local issues. And it was amazing to me the students and what some of their priorities were and what they thought um, services that were lacking um, kids in schools. If you could name a couple of those, what do you think are those areas that we could really um, shed some light on and, um, you know, maybe move some action to a couple areas that would help those kids in, in K through 12? I think K-6, middle school and high school, those kids have similar needs. And one of the startling ones is that in Washington State, as of like two years ago, at least 25 to 28 percent of our kids faced food insecurity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, from a family where we always had food in the fridge and there was always snacks for the kids, it breaks my heart. And then working in schools. So even older children, you know, 14, 16, 18, go home and there may not be something to eat. So that's one of the places. And I know the communities come together. Mm -hmm. Our, my office works within a group that does basically sends home backpacks mm -hmm. filled with food for kids on the weekend and over long holidays. Um, I know COVID has changed food services, but as a community, you know, accessing different resources to help, that's a really basic need before we even get to housing, but just making sure they have, food. you know, food to eat. And that sounds so third world, yeah. but it's happening in our community mm -hmm. um, and in communities around our state. So. Right. Thank you. Well, Casey, I have to say I had the honor of attending the Ronald McDonald Legacy Luncheon last week. I don't know if you were there, but mm -hmm. it was an amazing event and the work that's going on there. So thank you for that and everything else that you're doing. And we're glad Spokane got you back. Thanks. So, uh, to be here. And we're happy to put you to work <laughs> as quickly as possible. Sign up for other committees if you want. Any thank other you. questions <clears throat> for Casey? Just, just one. Good. What is something you maybe forgot about Spokane that you realized you really loved about Spokane when you came back? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I think I didn't forget, but I didn't realize how much I appreciated literally having four seasons until <laughs> last year when we had winter for six months. For a year, yeah. yeah. So, um, but that was one of the pieces that I did truly appreciate <clears throat> because we're outdoor family. It is a different environment. My kids grew up, you know, they're big now, but they grew up playing in the rain mm -hmm. because if we only played outside on days that didn't rain in Muckleteal, they play outside 30 days a year if it worked out with our schedule. So I appreciate just more opportunities to go out and enjoy different weather 
different seasons. And um, that's not really a city thing, it's just a geography thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No more questions, you'll come back. You don't have to come back again. We'll be voting on your appointment. Um, and so you'll just be hearing from us. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Casey. Nice to meet you. Thanks. As well. Next, we have David Edwards. Come on, David. Thank you for joining us today and for putting your name in for this position. Want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is David Edwards. It's an honor to stand here before you. Uh, I have a similar story. I grew up in Spokane Valley, and uh, when I turned 18, I went to Seattle to go to college and stayed there for 18 years, but was excited to, uh, to come back to Spokane six years ago. And I currently live right here in downtown Spokane. Mm -hmm. I'm raising my two daughters with my wife here. And uh, during COVID, it, uh, one of my daughters goes to St. George's, and the kids there are from an economic, um, a strong economic, uh, typically, uh, resources there. And so one of the projects was to discuss, you know, what do you think is wrong with the world? And because it's COVID, we're all at home in our, you know, in our, in our loft. And the kids are talking about things like um, global warming, um, climate change, which are very important issues. But the, th the thing that my daughter, uh, who was at the time only in the second grade, you know, said was, we need to do something about, well, she, in her words, homelessness. Mm -hmm. And, of course, her ideas and her solutions for that were very elementary. But it, it struck a chord with me. I've spent my whole, my whole life, even in high school, uh, in professions steeped in land uh, as a real estate broker. As uh, Right now, I'm a certified residential appraiser. I'm uh, a member of the land management unit for King County's Department of uh, Natural Resources and Parks. I work remote here. And living, uh, so I can see the different ways that land can be put into use. And living downtown, I'm on a first name basis with some people experiencing homelessness. You know, and you can give them, uh, give these people uh, resources in the winter. And I'll even ask them, you know, why are you out here? You know, uh, it's too cold. You need, to, you need to go inside. And sometimes uh, one of my acquaintances, Mike, will actually do that. Um, and so, all of these experiences have, it, it, this is the reason why I applied for the position. I love getting that, uh, my Spokane newsletter once, I think it's once a week, and at the bottom on the right-hand corner was the announcement of this volunteer opportunity. So um, that's why, why I applied, applied for the position, because I just like to try to make a difference in, you know, in some way. Um, I participated in the point in time count. I did the unhoused count outside, and it was another example, uh, talking about you know, interacting with people experiencing these issues. They all have a different story, mm -hmm. and they all have a different reason for why are they're, why they're there. Uh, one gentleman told me, you know, he, uh, he's not a big fan of Indiana Jones. He doesn't like the whip and uh, doesn't want to be inside. And other people were suffering from various health issues that made it so that they couldn't physically get into a... Uh, get into a, a shelter for, for whatever reason. So anyway, that's the reason why uh, I'm, I, I submitted my application. Thank you. Any questions for David? Where'd you go to high school? I went to, it's defunct. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Our Lady of the Rosary Academy in Hilliard. Okay, oh. it is defunct. Yeah, it okay. is, yes, very much so. All right. um, I, I, at the time, I think you probably know Gavin Cooley. I went there yes. with his kids. And oh, uh, wow. yeah, it was quite a, it was an interesting three years. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uniqueness about Spokane. We're all connected in some shape, form, or fashion. Yes. Thank you for putting your uh, you. application forward. Nothing else is required of you. We are lucky to have you again uh, and to serve on this committee. Uh, you'll be hearing from the mayor's office. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. I'm going to make a little change in the agenda. We are so honored to have Commissioner Cooney here with us today, and she has other commitments. So we're going to actually have the broadband come up. Eric, if you would, uh, that's 3.6 on your agenda today, and they're going to give us an update on what's going on there. And please introduce everybody that's with you. 
Thank you, uh, Council. We appreciate the time. Uh, so, uh, I, on behalf of the mayor and, and for us, uh, both in IT as well as uh, economic development, we really wanted to kind of advocate for everything we could as it relates to broadband and, and uh, kind of leveraging our conduit and fiber assets that we have in the city. And, and so, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, uh, Commissioner and, and Arian to talk about what is happening kind of on the state and county level uh, that we're, uh, I, I think, very, very glad and excited to participate in. Uh, so for the introductions piece, obviously Commissioner Cooney, uh, who's the Commissioner Chair for the Spokane County. Uh, uh, Arian Schmidt, who, who obviously has had several roles, you know, combined with city and county over the past few years and currently has been helping them with their ARPA distribution and is the interim uh, director, I guess is the right the title, for Broadlink, which is the new PDA that they uh, established just uh, a month or so ago. Um, and then uh, Steve and myself. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Commissioner Kutin. Thank you. So it's exciting to be here. As Arian said, she was going to come down and do this. I'm like, I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to just give a brief introduction as to how broadband really got going here in Spokane County in this iteration for us. So it was with the ARP dollars um, that were coming down from the federal government that we had the Council of Governments uh, January of 2021. So that's back when we decided to come together, talk about what the priorities, what the needs were for the community. And so it was at that Council of Governments that I sat next to Alex Scott, who works for Department of Commerce, and the Commerce Director, Lisa Brown, at that time. And we were hearing about broadband, you know, as part of one of the things that was, you know, available for the funding, um, and what could we do with that? And so um, through those connections, uh, met some people and talked to different individuals, and then went down to the South County, um, which is my district, and so had a town hall meeting with Leta, Waverly, Fairfield, and Rockford, and asked them what, what were their priorities. And so, again, broadband was really one of their number one priorities, because in that rural community, having kids be on, you know, from school, that they were having to zoom in and all of that, that it was a real uh, issue for them as well as we saw for workforce development, it's an issue in those smaller communities that don't have the broadband that we do here. And so I kind of took it upon myself at that time that this is gonna be an initiative that we're gonna look at. Um, brought Erin along, said okay, as we're looking at ARP dollars, and she was helping us with that, what can we do and how can we do this differently? And so it was through that that I'm gonna let Arian talk about the formation, but we put together what is called our broadband action team was kind of the first start of bringing again community members together to talk about broadband and what the needs were. And so with this infrastructure package and, and ARP dollars, we have the ability to use these for, they're really trying to get it out to mm -hmm. rural communities, but that also allows us that opportunity for the digital divide, equity divide that's going on uh, within cities to use it and leverage those funds. And so we see this as really a win-win for everybody. And that's why the county did put together a broadband or a, a public development authority for broadband because we felt it was gonna be better if we do it together than individually doing it. And so I'm gonna let Arian talk about the rest of it. Thank you, Commissioner Cuny, and thank you very much, Council, for letting us give this overview. Not only this is, is an overview, it's an invitation because the Public Development Authority has members, and it really is the foresight of Commissioner Cuny and the rest of the commissioners at the City of Spokane be an anchor member. Although this is countywide and, and incorporates the rural and undeveloped and small cities, it also we know that the City of Spokane is in Spokane County, and Spokane County only thrives when the City of Spokane is in lockstep with us. And so with that, the underlying concept is broadband has become a new essential utility. You need your water, you need your sewer, you need your electricity, but to really thrive in a resilient manner as an individual and as a household, broadband has become that. And whether you're in the rural areas of our county or in an urban core, the ability to not access that, whether it be through actual infrastructure or just the inability to know how, that is a real and present situation. And so although the federal government is really focusing on rural infrastructure expansion, as Commissioner Cooney um, illuminated, by having our urban cities involved in this, we, we hope and are planning that as these funds come in, there will be a trickle down and fall over into our urban core um, because of those funds as part of that regional 
entity that will allow a lot of undergirding that you might not be able to get otherwise if you tried to go after those funds as an urban city yourself. So the two focuses of the Broad, Broadlink Public Development Authority, which again is countywide, is for the expansion of broadband infrastructure. And we do want to leverage the one-time funding that's coming out from about, gosh, more than we can count federal and state entities. Again, originally focused for rural gaps, but that doesn't mean that there aren't gaps within city areas, whether those be public development authorities, whether those be uh, our economic development PDAs, whether those be bedroom communities, and we're trying to st strategically to understand that. But in addition to the broadband infrastructure, it's that digital equity component that has three legs of that stool. Is am I able to access the infrastructure available to me? And if I'm not, how do how do I take advantage of subsidies like affordable connectivity programs to allow me to get to that. We are woefully under-adopted inside our city core and rural areas. Well, once I have a connection, do I have devices to let me use things? Do I have a computer? Do I have other, other technologies? And then lastly, am I digitally literate? Do I understand how to thrive once I have connection and devices, whether that be for work, whether that be for schooling, whether that be for access to telehealth, behavioral health, or mental health. And all of those combined are what we are seeking in digital equity throughout the county. So as we go here, this slide deck that's in your packet kind of shows the different things that Broadlink is gonna be focusing on. And right now, as we're undergo undergoing the formation, we are also in lockstep working with our broadband action team that Commissioner CUNY mentioned. We have fantastic representation from council staff and stakeholders because again, this is an advisory board meant to understand what are the needs throughout the tapestry of our county. And this broadband action team is actually a requirement of the Washington Broadband Office in their deliverables to the federal government. So the things this team is working on will be a part of the state roll-up plan that will go to the federal government that will be the snapshot of Washington State, not only narratively, but also in the rubric or the formula for which then funding that we expect to come out later this year will come back to Washington State. So it really is a multiple plate spinning type, type of initiative. And then I just wanted to let you know, not unlike other areas of service like um, behavioral health or mental health, we are a part of a region. And the broadband region that we're a part of includes Stevens County, Ponderay County, and Ferry. And again, we have to understand what's going on because if we have a gap in service, um, because we didn't think big enough in some of our strategic projects, we're, we're cutting off whether it be our workers or our students or our patients that really thrive on what's offered in the downtown core. And that has been echoed by a number of stakeholders, whether it be Providence, multi-care, community colleges, to say, we have people that once they're in the hub, they're great but when they go home or they try to do something remotely, they're crippled. And so that's why this has to be part and parcel, understanding the spokes and the wheels have to go in and out together to make sure it is a holistic and resilient model. So these are the things as the Public Development Authority is actually being formed that we're focusing on. We have about $24 million that we are gradually hearing positive words about infrastructure related to our rural broadband eligibility areas, and each of those are coupled with a digital equity component. So like I said before, we may be building conduit and fiber in rural areas, but the digital equity part of that has to be applied countywide or else it doesn't work. And that's why the city of Spokane is really a, in, an integral partner um, for those, those rural initiatives in addition to what you guys bring to the table as being um, already invested into conduit and fiber throughout the city. Steve and Eric have done a great job in um, really getting to uh, see what is available right now as far as city conduit and fiber, and again, how that can connect to initiatives that are coming in from the rural area and making sure that this concept of open access or publicly funded infrastructures stays as such so that either from a provider perspective, allowing more providers to spin things up, or from a service perspective saying, do we ourselves want to be a proponent of other more publicly accessible services through what we have. 
So by considering membership in this public development authority, again, you're able to leverage those things that might not necessarily be applicable to the city as an urban core, but you're also going to be able to leverage your assets, retain those owned assets as part of what then is added to with all of the unique funding opportunities that are coming down the pike and will continue to come down the pike for, for several years related to broadband expansion in the region. So these are just a few snapshots that are in your packet of what we've, what we've been doing since Commissioner Cuny mentioned the Council of Governments in 2021 um, related to planning and operations and what we've already received related to funding. And again, this is just a sampling of what's coming down the pike. And the BEAD, which stands for the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment, that funding pot alone is estimated to be over a billion dollars coming to Washington State. And that's just one of all of these. And so what we're trying to do is understand from our city and unincorporated partners, what is a menu of strategic plans? Because each one of these has their own eligibility requirements so we can quickly pull off the shelf, yep, this one fits that, this one fits that, to make sure we're able to spin those up to make sure that everyone's needs um, get utilized. So that is really kind of that heads up um, overview of the Broadlink Public Development Authority. In your packet, you have an interlocal agreement um, that has been reviewed by City Legal along with uh, Steve and Eric. We would love for you to consider. We are in, in a, a timeline where we would like to have uh, your membership consideration looked at um, as far as whether you can do that on next week's uh, the 24th for review and consent because then we would ab be able to have you participate um, in your appointed board membership starting in May as all of these things are, are going literally at the, the speed of light um, going forward. So um, anything else, Commissioner Cuny? I guess one thing I do want to state is we are really looking at open access. So that is what Broadlink is really all about. Um, these are millions of dollars that are going to be coming into the community to help with broadband. Um, and so I'm very passionate about having it go open access so we get to choose for our citizens and help decide which providers those citizens are going to be using so it's not a provider that's already in service. It can be other providers that can access this network. And I like to use the analogy of it's like a bridge. Everyone knows I'm married to a bridge builder. Mm -hmm. um, so you spend millions of dollars to build a bridge. And then that bridge is part of the city. Um, with broadband, prior to open access, it would be the providers that would provide that bridge. And then they would get to determine how much they want to charge for a toll to go across that bridge, to maintain it, to, to make their profits, to take care of their um, shareholders. And so we're very adamant that we've been working very hard to keep this open access. So this is the citizens are the ones that then are in charge of, of these funds and these assets going forward. Councilmember Member Yeah, uh, a couple of questions. Um, well, I heard you before, um, Arian, in, in your comments, it sounded like you're leaving an opening for this PDA to operate its own ISP. Is that, is that where you're headed? It could. It could. Right now, it's it's slated to be what's called a dark fiber entity to where we build the infrastructure and then it can be lit up by any number of providers um, to offer a suite of services from, you know, baseline to robust. As time goes on, and again, this would be something that the board would determine, there is space and capacity. We're looking at other partners, one being Northwest Open Access Networks or NOAANET, to say, do we want to augment that and realize that maybe we want to go to the next level and um, actually create lit infrastructure for providers to come in because that's less again for them to sink into so there's a lot of this wet cement for lack of a better word that we're wanting to understand and carve but right now it is uh, scheduled as a dark fiber model okay i guess i would just say to that uh it's been a little while now but i've, I've done some research in the past on it and the costs typically are just astronomical for a city or governmental entity to operate its own isp uh, i think chattanooga is a great example of one and and frankly the costs were insane. I mean, half a billion dollars, and you were still paying what you'd pay Comcast. So it, it really didn't, I don't think, benefit. Uh, but that being said, creating that those access points, I think, is so critical to the future of our community. Um, but to follow that thread, too, you, you mentioned fiber a few times. And my understanding was this was going to be more 
uh, technology neutral or, or agnostic. And so is it just fiber or are we thinking about all the different things? Because some folks, and I'll speak specifically to folks in the city, and I learned this during, during COVID, I had no idea. There are some apartment complexes out there where they prohibit you from putting any infrastructure in that would allow you access to the internet. So, you know, some sort of fixed Wi-Fi or satellite becomes absolutely necessary unless policies are adopted that change that. But that's sort of the certain, you know, current situation for some folks that, uh, that we need to figure out how to get around. So I'm really hopeful that, that this will be agnostic. And then the last part is, do you envision this broadband PDA uh, providing or, or coming forward with any sort of policy recommendations for all the different entities so that we're all kind of in the same, um, you know, working off the same sheet? Because I, I could see some, you know, some things, probably minor, but some things, you know, like whenever the road is open, you're putting fiber in no matter what, that, that sort of thing. So. so to chunk through the responses, on the first one, it's, it's all of the above. And I, I didn't send this to Eric, but I'll make sure that you get this. This is, this is a picture of um, all of the different layers that go into creating fiber and broadband, all the way from the dirt in the ground to the clicks of the button. Mm -hmm. And the one on the top that's all black is the old model of where private ISPs own everything from the bottom to the top. And to answer your first question, this new open access model allows the public sector to own pretty much the first three layers. And then this is that fourth layer that you're talking about where we're not exactly the end customer, to your point, provider that is expensive, but we minimize some of that middle layer technology so that we're not duplicating things. And this is really the sweet spot of what, what we want to do. And why this is timely today is private sector has not been able to pencil out the investment to get to some of these digital wastelands. Um, and so that's where, to Commissioner Keeney's point, we're doing the heavy lifting, but then allowing any ISP then to make that minimal investment maybe even a public ISP to then offer those services suite from that application layer. So I'll make sure I, I leave that, that with you because you're, you're absolutely right on that. And as far as the mixed technologies, yes and, comma. Um, so broadband has definitely become a moniker where it means more than just cabled wired. It actually means the ability for high capacity util utilization on the internet. And policy at both the federal and the state level has expanded so that now fixed and semi-fixed wireless solutions are allowable in our scopes, which is wonderful because, you know, from your example to topography where I live in the valley, you know, the only thing that hasn't quite crossed that bridge is the low orbit satellite. So those are still excluded. Okay. Um, but we're inching our way there. But we have been doing blended scopes for that. Your last one, because Commissioner Cuny does need to leave, is um, yes, this board will be um, talking not only about local policy, but because of the commissioner's leadership, we are also advising policy at a state and federal level. Mm -hmm. We have monthly calls with um, Senator Cantwell, who's trying to understand at the at the, the broadband action team and county level, what needs to happen in DC? Uh, Congresswoman McMorris Rogers had a round table. She's like, what, do, what needs to happen that what we said at the federal level actually accomplishes what it needs to do on the boots on the ground, our broadband office. So there is a lot of opportunity to direct policy at all levels through this PDA and others are looking to Spokane for that. Th thank you guys very much. Mm -hmm. I just had one thing I was just going to on this kind of same issue of cities get involved when we when our council um, stakeholder group met on this previously one of the best examples was to me as if you were depending on FedEx or UPS to get your packages under the old system the expensive Chattanooga UPS would have their own highway system to get to you and FedEx and in this one no, there's one highway system. We pay a user, you know, we charge them a user fee, a gas tax, whatever it is, but they do that. And it just dramatically decreases the price for us. So, Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, we look forward to hearing more. I'm sure this will be in a discussion up soon. And uh, good to see you, Commissioner Cooney. Anything else, Mr. Finch? I, I, and I just wanted to, to leave with uh, thank, thank you again for the time. And you know, we we would request you know that that uh, next Monday that you would consider you know both the, the first reading and, and and the vote, so we could get uh, a board member uh, then you know appointed to the board to seat in May. Perfect. Right. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. All right. Have a good afternoon. I'll just say thank you. And any other questions, feel free to just reach out. Absolutely. Thanks. Hurry Thanks. up, get to your meeting, Commissioner Cooney. That's right. Go, 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 go. Thank you very much. Next up, we'll be back on track. So we're going to have uh, human resources from Mr. Piccolo.
Good afternoon. This is the SBO that goes with the contract extension with Archbright for the uh, HR department. This is a transfer of funds within the, the HR budget currently, so there is no additional funds going into this contract uh, for the department. So this will again will pay for the contract extension with calling it from Archbright. No questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Christopher, if you want to come on down and we'll do our first quarter investment report. We are already running a little bit behind time, so I'm going to ask everybody to be as succinct as possible with your presentation and your questions. Good afternoon, Chris Johnson, Deputy Treasurer, and thank you for some time today to go over our first quarter investment report. So we'll go over the um, typical topics, which is our current cash and investment balances, as well as the portfolio composition and its performance during the quarter. And then we'll tackle a little bit something different, which is some high level view on the internal and external debt of the city. <clears throat> so as of the end of the quarter, we ended with a little over $384 million in cash and investment balances. And that's about a 6% decline from where we ended the fourth quarter of last year. <clears throat> Overall, we're still in our seasonal trend that is scheduled to end about around the middle of May when we receive our property tax revenue infusion. And that should be the point of inflection to the upside where we start the process all over again. And as you can see, that's depicted there in the graph below that table. As to the portfolio's composition, what did we own at the end of the quarter? 65% of the portfolio was invested in federal agency-based debt, and the remainder was roughly split between our internal loans, our municipal securities, our treasurer's cash, and our U.S. securities positions. Off to the right is the table that shows whether we complied or did not comply with our investment policy mandate to ensure maximum level exposure to insurers, <coughs> or issuers, excuse me. And we fully complied, and it also states our largest to um, minimal holdings in the portfolio, and our largest holding at the end of the quarter was Fannie Mae. Now, as to the activities of the portfolio during the quarter, what came off the portfolio and what did we add? Uh, 62 million plus came off the portfolio in the form of maturities. Most of those were federal agency-based debt, along with some U.S. Treasuries. The average coupon was a, around 1%. The average yield was about 1%, so it was welcomed that they did fall off the portfolio given that they are low-yielding investments. <clears throat> so what did we do with the um, money that came back to us? $40 million was actually reinvested into new positions and added to the portfolio, and the remainder of the balance was held in the local government investment pool or treasurer's cash. Um, for the $40 million reinvested, we focused on U.S. Treasuries and federal agency-based debt. We had an average coupon of 3.5% and an average yield of 4%, so that's about three and a half times on the coupon what came off, four times what came off in terms of yield. And we focused, if you remember the February investment report, that middle portion of our structure, we focused on the three-year maturities for all of those positions and rounded that structure out completely. So going forward, we should be looking at anything less than 12 months for any reinvestment activity for the rest of the year. As to the portfolio, in terms of liquidity, about a little over a third of the portfolio is due back to us in less than two years' time. So at the end of Q1, we're sitting pretty good from a liquidity standpoint. Um, the two- to three-year portion of the portfolio, there's several uh, good-sized positions hugging that 24-month-plus, and those will age down into the liquidity range as we move throughout the year. So looking good for the remainder of the year from a liquidity standpoint. As to the performance, we ended uh, the quarter with 9.4 million in unrealized losses. Now again, we're a hold to maturity investor. So unless we decide to sell positions that have losses attributed to them, we won't recognize them. <clears throat> so to put that in perspective, when I was here before you in March, we had 13.7 million on unrealized losses. So interest rates went in our favor and increased the value of our holdings, including the ones we just put on in March. So that's kind of that ebb and flow um, in terms of the market uh, reaction and how it impacts our prices in the portfolio. Overall interest income was $2.4 million for the quarter. So the portfolio is doing what it is designed to do, which is to secure our principal and to produce income for city funds that are participating in that allocation process. 
As to the performance versus our newly minted benchmark that was put in place in February, we had 2.6 years on the average maturity. Our benchmark uh, has about two years. But then again, if you remember the conversation on the strategy, we were looking for two and a half years, so we almost hit it right on the head. And that was intentional to go over the benchmark and focus on that middle portion of that uh, structure that we spoke to in the uh, February investment report. Given that we added three-year positions, our duration ticked up a bit, 2.4 years versus our benchmarks 1.9, a little bit more in terms of um, susceptible to interest rate movement, but nothing to be concerned of, and it was intentional. The portfolio's coupon on average outperformed our benchmark, a little over 2% versus a little less than one and a quarter. So our portfolio is generating more interest income than would be if we complied with our benchmark there. So that's a, that's a good development. And our yield is still underperforming the benchmark um, somewhat substantially. Uh, but to put it in perspective, when I was here again in Feb for the February investment report, we were at 2.54%. Now we're almost at two and three quarters and that is directly reflective of putting those new positions on at higher degrees of yield, which is exactly the yield to uh, hold to maturity strategy. You have to be patient, money comes off, hopefully you have opportunities to put it to work at higher yields. So now I'd like to switch to um, more, uh, re move from investments into the uh, world of debt, if you will, and go over some, <clears throat> just some high level aspects to the internal and external portions of the city debt. So, we have an internal lending function. It's referred to as commonly SIP lending or interfund lending. And um, we have a mandate by our policy not to exceed 15% of our portfolio with these internal loans. And that's specifically because they are not liquid. We have no market to sell them to. So the 15% is a mandate by policy. So how much uh, additional internal lending capacity do we have for our respective funds? That is provided by taking that 15% to the total portfolio value, deducing the current outstanding portfolio, and that gives you your gross capacity there at 16.4 million at the end of the quarter. We further, to be a little bit prudent here, we further reduce that figure by any pending projects, whether that is just kind of word of mouth or actually something that's gonna to come to fruition within the next six to 12 months. And we, further, we further reduce that um, gross number by that amount. So we have pending projects that are estimated to be about 4.9 million, and that gives us a net portfolio capacity for internal lending of about 11.5 million at the end of the quarter. So that is the portfolio portion of the capacity to make loans internally. You also need to have the liquidity to do so. So surplus cash is important above and beyond what we need for operations, or you really can't fund a loan. So that, I think, makes sense. Off to the right is another graphic, a bar chart there, that shows the uh, internal lending situation that is in existence right now. So the large uh, column there to the left is the current balance of our internal loans, which is a little over 31.5 million. And then subsequent uh, annual payments for 23, 24, and 25. So that yellow bar uh, there, I'd like to call your attention to of about 8.4 million plus. That represents a balloon payment. So what transpired during the uh, pandemic era was that we repriced our loans, the internal loans in, that we currently had on, on hand, and we lowered the interest rate, and therefore we lowered the monthly payment, or I guess it would be the annual payment. And in doing so, we did not restructure the timeline in which they were to pay off. So the amortization schedule of those loans kind of got a little skewed. You have lesser payment, but the same time to pay off. So basically you're ended up with a large payment at the end of that loan term, and that's commonly referred to as a balloon. So there are several loans internally that have this balloon situation, and that will have to be addressed sometime this year or next. In, in the, can, uh, oh, go ahead. Can I stop you? Yeah, just sure. for, Did that come through council? I don't recall being briefed on. I know you probably weren't here, but I wasn't. Do you, is there a record that we approved that restructuring? I imagine, that? yeah. Okay, I'd yeah. love to see that when you get a chance. Okay, so. I believe I've seen something in that, okay. yeah. Uh, so anyway, that, those are going to have to be both repriced and restructured so that we can get a new amortization schedule in place for payment to where we can get those loans to pay off to zero. So right now, those loans that are attributed to that balloon balance uh, have um, interest rates of little less than 1%. So they're probably not going to get the same deal given the rate environment now. So some funds may have more interest expense and or greater payments in order to get that uh, balance of their loans to zero. And finally, I'd like to talk to uh, Council about the external debt situation. So 
we have a, a grade on our debt, and it's double A, which is the best uh, grade, debt grade that we can get as a city of our size. And Moody's Analytics configures that grade for us um, throughout um, time, every year, I think. And uh, they've come up with a new scoring methodology that they instituted at end of last year, early this year. So it, what Treasury's goal is this year is to provide council and the administration insight into that methodology because it is a weighted scoring. And it would be nice to know which portions of that scoring methodology matter most and what feeds into it in terms of data and activity within the city that impacts that scoring methodology. And then relay that to you so that, you know, when you're at the decision-making table and you consider the debt rating, you at least know what makes it up and how it's calculated. I think that's valuable. So that's the goal of the Treasury sometime uh, later this year, early next year at the latest. That is all I have for the first quarter investment report. Are there any questions? Council Member Bingo. So our, this is not specifically about this, and this might be a topic we discuss offline, but the SIP loan capacity being 15% of the portfolio, is that through our SMC, is that where we've set that number? Is that a number that we could adjust? Um, it's within policy, so you could adjust the policy, I imagine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It has been adjusted from 10 to 15 in the past, mm -hmm. so it was 10% uh, not too long ago. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Uh, let's continue on then with the quarterly financial report. Did you do it all? That would be just. That was it? Yep. You're done? Yep. Ooh, thank Thanks. you very much. <laughs> all right, next we're going to have um, Teresa, Thea. Is Thea here? Who's going to present on the police purchase? Amendment to police purchase? There she comes. Uh, for the police substitution? Yes. Yeah. I hear that, would be, that would be me, Rick Giddings, fleet director. Oh, there's Rick. Thank you, Rick. Good afternoon. Um, can uh, everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, we have been informed that Ford is over production capacity for Ford Interceptor uh, K8 hybrids. And uh, of which we've got 71 ordered and will not be able to fill all of the orders that they have nationwide. So this is, uh, the situation has evolved a little bit since the briefing paper was submitted. Uh, Bud Clary, our Ford dealer, just uh, recently last week made us an offer to voluntarily substitute a portion of our accepted hybrid orders for non-hybrids uh, sort of in advance, in advance of what we know is going to be uh, what are going to be official order cancellations in the next month or so. Uh, their statement is that if we do this, this will maximize our chances of getting all of our orders filled and securing uh, earlier build slots. So given the uh, urgent and critical need for police vehicles currently, we have submitted a request to Bud Clary to substitute 31 sergeant and patrol cars, uh, the vehicles that we're in the most dire need for. Um, so some, some things to understand. First off, this, this request isn't really an order yet, and even if it is an order, uh, we can cancel it with no penalty until the build slot is scheduled. Uh, we just thought it was important to be at the front of what is undoubtedly going to be a very long line uh, once, the, once the rest of the nation gets the hybrid police car orders canceled. Uh, another thing, since, since hy uh, hybrids are not considered clean or alternative fuels by, uh, fuel vehicles by the standards of uh, Washington state law or Spokane Municipal Code, we are not really, we're not substituting a clean fuel vehicle for a non-clean fuel vehicle. Uh, we're simply substituting a vehicle that is rated at 24 miles per gallon for a very similar vehicle that is rated at 20 miles per gallon. Uh, since the, uh, the non-hybrids cost about $4,000 less to purchase, or to, yeah, to purchase, uh, the total life cycle costs are, are nearly identical. In fact, uh, the non-hybrids trend slightly less at, at the current fuel prices. Um, and canceled orders are not price protected, so, uh, and, and they, they don't give us priority for the next model year. This means if we don't substitute, we would have to reorder at next year's higher price and add an entire year to our wait for these vehicles with no certainty that they will actually be built. So, so making the substitution will prevent further delays in vehicle delivery timeframes and uh, the additional costs associated with ordering the vehicles. So we brought this to City Council for a, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, although our purchasing department um, 
has informed us that this type of substitution would not normally require an additional city council vote. Uh, for transparency, our goal is to inform city council of this development and allow some discussion on the topic. If it is determined that we need to go back for a, for a second vote on this, uh, we would like to continue this process to amend the existing OPRs back both back in 2022, 2022-0030 and 2022-0572 uh, as quickly as we can to allow for an unknown number of, of hybrid vehicles to be substituted. I'm happy to enter in any discussion you'd like on this. Councilmember Member Yeah, I, uh, well, first of all, I think it's really important we get these things ordered uh, ASAP. Uh, but my question is, I thought, and maybe I am just wrong on this, but I thought our policy was that we essentially went with the lowest life cycle cost. And if you're telling me that the, the non-hybrid is the lowest life cycle cost, then I guess why, why was that not brought forward the last time when we, when we actually put the order in? And maybe I'm wrong on that, well, but I, I, that's my understanding. No, and it's, and it's a great question, and, and you are right. And the, the fact is, is the, that, the, that the total cost of operation, life cycle costs for the hybrids versus the non-hybrids have been neck and neck forever. And it really comes down to the price of fuel. Price of fuel has gone down a little bit since, since we ordered last year, and so, uh, so that edged. But we're talking about a penny per mile difference, okay. and, it, and it can fluctuate one way or the other. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilmember Bingle. I guess, Rick, what's just the best pathway forward for us to get the vehicles here for us to be using? What's the fastest way forward for us to get vehicles that are gonna be useful to our police department to get them going? Yeah, and this, this we think is the, the, the fastest path. Now we've only substituted 31. That doesn't mean, and we haven't officially substituted them yet, but that doesn't mean that, that we're necessarily going to get them any faster, but we have been told that that um, uh, we, we should. We should get earlier build slots. The vehicles cost a little bit less. Um, this whole uncertainty with the hybrids uh, as far as how many they're going to cancel will add some delays, especially if we wait clear till the end when, uh, the, when everybody else is kind of in line to get their vehicles substituted. So I think this is the fastest path forward. We're not substituting all of them but we want to make sure that we get in on the ground floor of the vehicles that we're in the most critical need for. Councilmember Stratton. Hey Rick, it's Karen. Um, short of having you show us anything that's confidential, can we see some of that, um, those emails or that correspondence between the city and, is it Ford? I think Bud you said. Clary, Bud Clary Ford. Mm -hmm. Right, can we see some of that? Bud Clary Ford. Yeah, it's from Bud yeah, Corey Ford can, and some that of that. Too. I think I'd do I better understanding this if I could just see what I'm, if I could just look at it. Absolutely. I don't think there's anything that's proprietary in there. We've been, I was at a, a conference in Vancouver and we were clued into this a few weeks ago and then we got an official notification uh, from Bud Clary uh, last week. And so, yeah, I can, I can send you those emails. Um, I think once they kind of tally up the number of, people who are volunteering, voluntarily willing to do some of this, uh, that'll give them a better idea of the official number of cancellations. And so I can, of course, keep you in the loop on that as well. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Kelsey. You're welcome. Yeah, Rick, um, you know, last year you really sold us on the hybrid that said, hey, they're pretty close to the EVs and then the price is good and the life cycle is good. So it's, it's a little hard to hear now, like, well, no, hybrids aren't good. So I, I just, I'm just noting that, that little whiplash. But you live in this all the time and are working hard and working hard for us. So I really appreciate that. Could you tell us what, when are we going to hear about the cancellations? I think that's the hard thing because I, I don't understand whether all of ours are going to be canceled, a proportion across the board. And maybe we don't know that yet, but when are we going to know actually what the cancellations are for the hybrids? Yes, Council President, the prediction is May sometime, and I wish I had more specificity for you. Um, they, they're, going to, they're going to close down the factory that builds the hybrids uh, in July, and so they're trying not to overschedule uh, before the close down. And so I, I think that this is a moving target for right now. Um, so. But we think that May is going to be the time that we're going to get an official notification. It may be, 
likely it's going to be kind of close to that 30 mark, but we have no way of knowing. This is all rumor at this point. Um, and, and just to be clear, the hybrids are good. If we could get the hybrids and not have to wait two years for them, uh, you know, the, we, we do like them. The, the police love them, right? They're, they're a great vehicle. But the, the, the sad reality is we're not going to get them all. And so, um, so at this point, we just need to find a way to get vehicles. We're, we're in a situation with, with police vehicles that there are certain events that won't be able to be staffed because we don't have sufficient vehicles to put officers in. So, so it's, it's critical that we get them as quickly as we can. And when we're talking about a total cost of ownership that is virtually identical, um, I, I don't think we're making a bad decision. And then I, my recollection of the ordinance that approved this was we were very specific about hybrids and then Mach-E's as another alternative. What's the latest availability on Mach-E's? Mach-E's are, we have purchased several. Uh, we've got, I think, seven in the fleet now. Um, and, I, and I'll have to go back and check those numbers. Uh, we did order all that we could on those. We are we are planning a, a another order for some more kind of an unknown number for the 2024 needs for admin cars. Our, our issue is that these sergeant cars and uh, patrol cars, uh, the Mach-E doesn't doesn't fit the need for that. Um, and we're in a similar situation. The order window is not open for the Mach-E's currently, so we'd have to wait for that to, to open back up. Uh, so. Could we, could we find a few Mach-E's that would work in the world out there? Probably, um, but they would only work for the, for the admin type cars. And what my understanding is that New York City is using them for patrol, and that's a pretty, I don't think it gets any grittier than New York City. Is that your understanding? I'm, I'm just wondering. I know it, we said we were going to evaluate once we had them rather than commit to them. I'm just wondering how the evaluation for patrol, have we outfitted any for patrol to see how they work? Uh, where are we at with that? Yeah, and, and no, we, we haven't outfitted any for patrol for uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, the dimensions are, are very similar to that of the Tesla, and sort of we've already done the work on on, on the measurements about you know, fitting two officers in there. My understanding is that New York is putting one officer per vehicle, or uh, and and not, and using them in a, in a, in a more uh, not in a hot seat situation, right? So um, so. Are there some other ones, some other Mach-E's that we could we could shoehorn a use for? It's a possibility, uh, but I, we're not going to get them any faster. Is I guess the kind of the, the, the point of this? Are, but aren't don't most of our officer? I mean, when I see patrol vehicles, they usually have one officer, not two. I know that for field training officers, there needs to be two. But for the majority of patrols out at any one time, aren't they single officer use? And I, I would have to, I, I believe Major McNabb is uh, there, and uh, for operational uh, questions, he may be a better resource. Okay. All right. Well, we can, we can hear from him. Major McNabb, you time. want to come on down and Councilman I'll, check out what's your question? I'll and my, it's actually related. I was just going to point out that the Major drives one of those mach and, and I've gone out and checked it out, and, and uh, I, I think it's, it's definitely too small, but I would let the Major uh, refer, reference that. Yeah, so uh, start with New York City. I did meet with them. They're, uh, they are putting one officer in them, which isn't a problem for us. Most of our cars run with one officer. We'd like to have the option to have two in them just for the versatility of it, but they're not putting cages in them, so we couldn't do prisoner transports, and they're such a big agency that they just call somebody else that has a cage to do the transport. We don't have that kind of luxury around here. Um, they, uh, the, the car works great. For admin use, uh, detectives, I'm sold. They're perfectly suitable for that. Um, if I know you guys have not heard the um, briefing on the fleet matrix study, but their recommendation for implementing electric vehicles is to do what just what we're doing with the, the Mach-E's, is to start with admin and slowly work our way down and watching the market as we do this to find a suitable police vehicle. Okay. Thanks. All right. Two quick questions because we're running out of time. Quick. Quick. Council Member Bingle and Council Member Zappone. Yeah. And uh, for clarity's sake, if we were to not hot seat these vehicles but just actually issue these to individual officers for patrol, would that be something that works as opposed to using them in, in a hot seat situation? It, possible. I would want to outfit one first and see how it works, see how much it costs to outfit them, mm -hmm. see what the 
the, you know, what the capacity is in the backseat for prisoner transports and all that stuff. Uh, one thing the matrix study did call out, as I said, we were probably a little too aggressive with the Teslas, making them patrol cars first rather than the other way around, which is what we're doing with the mach -E's. So if we were assuming all things dimensionally worked out, financially they made sense, would this be something that if we had enough of them? Because the problem with, with this as a patrol car isn't that um, it, it, uh, if we found one that dimensionally worked, it would be fine. It's just that currently the, with the recharge uh, timing, it makes it impossible for us to hot seat these vehicles. Is that correct? That, that is one consideration, but you could look at it only giving them to uh, officers that have have them for take home cars would that application work if the dimensions were correct i think my car is a standard battery and i'm correct me if i'm wrong rick is there a, an extended range mach -E available because the range is about 100 miles less than the teslas mm. i believe <coughs> yeah we are buying extended range on the on the walkies um are or are so not they, they, I, we are okay um and i and i believe they they are considered to be a 300 mile range. Of course, we, we won't get anywhere near that for a variety of reasons, usage, the temperatures that we deal with. But um, um, so, and, and I know we substituted some of the mach -E's, so I, I may be wrong on that, but our original intent was to order the extended range. Well, I know that just from experience, the extended range Tesla Model Y, when it's fully charged is 300 something miles, when the car I'm driving right now is fully charged is 217. Councilman, yeah, I was question. just wondering about the update about the Ford F-150 Lightnings, because that was part of it, too. It wasn't just mach -E's. So we got a cancellation on those, and then they offered us to reorder at a much higher price without the extended batteries. So we just said we're going to go with mach -E's for right now instead of the Lightnings. Well. Thank you. Thank you for that. One, one quick. But, Major, could you just send us the details on the, the costs? Uh, the, the lightnings and the Maki's, all that that you have. Yeah, we can pull that together. That'd Absolutely. Yep. Thank you very much. And Councilmember Cathcart, you're good sponsoring moving forward. Yeah. Great. Do you need two? Is there two for that? Contract amendment. So two. These two. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. Jessica, I overlooked you. My apologies for the quarterly financial report. Hmm. Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks again. Good afternoon. So yeah, today I'll be going over the first quarter financial report. What Chris, Chris went over was more like balance sheet, and what I do is more like income statement, if that helps at all. So I wanted to start by saying the first quarter analysis with the limited data available to us, for instance, like taxable sales is only one month's worth. Um, just want to get right out the gate and say that there's no indication of any significant variances at this time that would require a budget adjustment. So that's the bottom line of this report. Um, however, I do want to say that variance reporting here at the city is challenging due to um, a couple of reasons, which I'll be going over. One of those challenges is noted, noted on the cover page here, and that is that the city uses cash accounting throughout the year. So this means the city records revenue and expenses only when cash is exchanged. <clears throat> and then uh, at the end of the year, the accounting team switches over to modified accrual accounting. So this is a fundamental difference between the report I'm showing you right now, which is periodic reporting, and the year-end report that you're scheduled to see next month. All right, so let's begin here. So section one of the report, and section one, just so you know, is general fund on its own. Here we see the year-to-date budget variance for general fund revenues and expenses. Another caveat that makes periodic variance reporting difficult here is you'll see there's an asterisk next to budget year to date. That is because here at the city, we budget annual figures. And so we have to calculate what we believe a periodic budget would be, whether it's monthly or quarterly. And we can do that in a couple of different ways. For the general fund, we calculate the year to date budget by comparing last year's monthly actuals 
to the percentage difference between the previous year's total actuals and this year's budget. So if last year's actuals were a certain number and this year's budget was say 10% more, we take the monthly figure from last year and we multiply it by 110%. So again, this is just an estimation, a calculation of what we think the estimated budget year to date would be. And then we compare actuals to it. And this table indicates that the general fund revenue is favorable to budget when we do this by 2.3% and the general fund expenses are unfavorable to budget by 6.8%. And we're gonna dive into these variances. So on this general fund cover page, if we go down to this table, what we see here is general fund revenues and expenses uh, as amended during 2023, except for they haven't been. Every quarter in the footnote, you'll see uh, what exact SBOs and budget transfers contributed to the amendment. But again, for first quarter, all we've done is we process the annual recurring encumbrance carry forward. So the adopted revenue and expense figures have remained unchanged thus far. Okay, so page two begins a deeper dive into the general fund revenues. You can see general fund departments have received around 10% of annual budgeted revenues. Again, during the year, the, ca the accounting team only records revenue when cash is received, not when it is earned. So that is why you are seeing less than one third of revenues received. Our next big influx of cash will be in May when we get the first half of property taxes. And then because non-departmental gets about 90% of the general fund revenues, the bottom table shows which revenue categories are trending above last year's actuals. And here we see growth in taxes, licenses and permits and miscellaneous revenues. So let's talk about more of that. So page three breaks out general fund revenues in total by category. These agree with the previous page and shows miscellaneous revenues is contributing the most to that 2.3% favorability we talked about at the beginning. So not only is the Spokane investment pool earning more interest than expected as Chris talked about, but Airway Heights paid their annual annexation mitigation payment on time for the first time. We received it in January when we agreed that's when we would receive it. So that alone is $400,000 more than last year's trend and contributes to the favorability. Okay, so let's move on to general fund expenditures. And I know that there's a lot of red up there if you can actually see the red. But I will say that there's only one department that at this time truly appears to be over budget. As stated previously, variance reporting is difficult at the city because throughout the year we record expenses only when cash is exchanged and then we have to calculate the year-to-date budget. So when I looked up all of these unfavorable departments, I found basically one main theme, and that is annual expenses being incurred at the beginning of the year instead of steadily throughout the year. So paying for annual membership dues, paying for operating supplies just within the first couple months of the year is what I saw again and again. So even that one department that was truly over budget they could make it up if their vacancy savings, with their vacancy savings by the end of the year. So this is general fund departments. So let's talk about general fund categories. And again, we see more of the same as you expect. When we look at general fund expenses by categories, we see supplies, dues, interfund building, and even transfers outs are unfavorable to budget. And that is because cash was exchanged faster than the calculated quarterly budget expected. So when these unfavorabilities are looked at using a different lens, when I use annualization or even averaging methods, they are fine. So this is how we arrived at, we do not see any significant adjustments that need to be made to the general fund budget right now. Yes. So question. Um, so my understanding is that right now, I, I assume it's the department you're referring to, our police department is over on overtime by about 650,000. So that's well above the 250 that was in the ordinance that we passed last year on the variance. Um, realizing that that may not put them over on their entire line item, but if you project that out, knowing that there's, I think, 30 some officers on light duty, 20 vacancies, it's not going to get better. So projecting that out, I think we can tell right now that there's going to be a significant, likely to be a significant overage. So 
would that not fall under the need for us to adjust uh, there? So interestingly enough, that is not the department I was referring to. Oh. <laughs> but I will say police is on internally what I would call a watch list, so you are correct. And when I did annualization and I did averaging, it did appear that with vacancy savings that they could be under. So just at this time, it is too early to tell. But something we should keep an eye on. We, yes, we are monitoring it, yes. So what is the one department? Well, I don't want to put anyone on blast. Okay. <laughs> but it's communications, and that's because we had a director who had a long tenure that retired. Gotcha. We had to pay out the accrued leave, essentially, yes. all at yeah. once. In all at a once. short period of time. Yeah. yeah, for his many years of service. Could, but can we go to the police? I mean, what's your sense of the overtime, if we're that far out of whack on our overtime budget, even after we increased it substantially this last year to what they requested to say, no, this is realistic. If we're already this far out of whack, what steps are being taken to address that? Because what has happened the last few years is that we've got to the end of the year mm -hmm. yeah. and we've had some one-time money that we could use. We don't have that anymore, but it's too late to do anything. So we're very interested in acting now Mm -hmm. to adjust it. So what recommendations does your, I'm not saying it's your job to do, but what recommendations right. are being made and what actions are being taken to make sure that by the end of the year we're okay? I mean, I think that's an excellent question for Chief Meidel. I will say that I was in the cabinet meeting when it was talked about and he is aware. Okay. So but just, just one more. I mean, I, I think that's great. And if there's internal uh, efficiencies, improvements we can make, that's important. But if not, there is sort of the other side of this, which is, you know, the, the priority discussion around, is this a priority for us? I think it is. It is for me. I will speak for myself. It is for me. And if that's the case, then how do we make up that 650 elsewhere if that's what we have to do? And I don't think that's up to the chief. I think that's up to, to all of us. So. Right. Yeah. Quick question. Quick question. I, I was just wondering, is that overtime for police also including the overtime that they're using at track? Is that part of the same number? Or is that a different categorization? I believe it's the same number, yeah. Okay. I think that's important overtime. to know. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so page six of this general fund, and it does go faster after this, guys. Page six is the general fund reserve. And basically, I'll just say this report doesn't really show anything, and that's because the 2022 unappropriated fund balance continues to be unknown at this time because the year in process isn't complete. And again, there were no general fund SBOs outside of the annual encumbrance carry forward. So these numbers continue to be unchanged. So that's the general fund. And then, like I said, this gets faster. Section two of the quarterly report are other funds. So literally all other funds instead of just the general fund. And really what we see here are other fund revenues and expense variances against, again, once timing and revenue uh, of revenue and expenses are taken into account, I don't see any red flags. Um, a lot of, for instance, a lot of the enterprise funds don't get their revenue until, um, the, the, dependent on the weather, really, water in particular, uh, until the sun comes out and we can water our lawns, et cetera, for all the other funds. They all have their own seasonalities. So page 14 through 21 is the CIP project uh, status update to all 2022 projects so that anyone can get, if they are so inclined, get an update on all of the many CIP projects we have. If there's additional questions, I suggest you reach out to the Associated Department head. And then at section four of the quarterly report are economic indicators that we put out there for consideration. And right now they show what we expect. Um, we'll see that unemployment in the Spokane area is experiencing its typical seasonal increase. And also on taxable sales, you can see that in total they have increased year over year. And although I do hear a lot about retail trade and that itself has decreased year over year, the other categories, especially accommodation and food service, has more than made up for that. So that is why taxable sales in total are still favorable compared to last year. Mm. Okay, is there any questions? No. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. We won't admit it, but our heads are spinning. Next, we're going to have the uh, Fire Department uh, Integra Study Progress Report. I don't know who's presenting that. Is that online, Jacoby? There shouldn't be a, there shouldn't be a presentation. It was just included as a, a packet. In our packet? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, then. No, no presentation. No presentation. Okay. 
In that case, we'll move on to the charter amendment on redistricting. Councilman McEckhart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and so this should have been circulated, uh, I think, a couple of weeks ago. It was also in the packet. Uh, and then today, uh, Shay, I think, sent out just a, a chart that we just to try and break it down and make it a little easier to, to digest. Um, but I'll just kind of go over the, the high points and then I'll answer questions best I can. And I know uh, one of our city attorneys who helped me put this together, uh, Mike Piccolo, is here. And I think if there's some legal questions, he could probably try to address those. Um, but effectively, what, what we did was, uh, or what this does, is repeals the two existing charter uh, provisions that uh, we currently operate under. So one is the redistricting and the other is the districting. It creates a lot of confusion, but it, it repeals both and replaces it with one singular uh, uh, charter amendment that I think uh, improves the, the, the process and also clarifies uh, quite a bit as well. Um, the high points are right now, under the current process, the mayor appoints three commissioners, uh, all confirmed by this council, and then two council members uh, act as advisory members. This would eliminate the city council role um, of an advisory. Uh, keeps, I think it keeps a good distance from the electeds uh, and this process, which to me makes a ton of sense. We saw that at the county, um, with the one exception of them uh, appointing the chair, uh, which I address in here uh, differently than they did it. Um, they, the, the, the county really was not a part of that process. They tried to leave it separate. And so I think that that's an important consideration for us. So what this does is it allows the mayor to appoint three commissioners. It allows the, the city council members to appoint, or as a body, to appoint three commissioners. And then the idea is, much like the state and the county processes, uh, their final decisions are a supermajority requirement so that we know that there is consensus amongst uh, these, these different individuals uh, for, for whatever they, they agree upon. So whether that's the non-voting chair or the final map uh, that they send to the city council, we know that they have consensus around that um, decision. Um, it also changes kind of the end point, which has been obviously one area of contention where uh, it effectively says that if the city council votes down what is brought forward by the redistricting commission, then that is automatically remanded back to that redistricting commission for further work, rather than giving this body uh, the ability to, to make any of its own changes. It puts it back in the hands of the, the citizen commissioners to, to make the, the final decision. Um, the process would largely follow state law. Uh, it's, it's written out here. Uh, it follows the RCW 29A.76.010 um, in terms of what we consider for how the redistricting uh, occurs. It would, because of the larger body, they would actually produce five maps, have additional meetings, so it would, I think, further public engagement. There's requirements on transparency, uh, streaming of the meetings, making sure the minutes are accessible within a 21 days, uh, hopefully quicker than that, but at least within 21 days. And then the last part is, right now in our charter, it allows for a mid-decennial redistricting process. Uh, to my knowledge, it's never been attempted uh, to be used, but the idea is that city council on its own initiative, midway through, could start this process. Uh, what I included in this is the idea that the citizenry could uh, if they go collect signatures, and it's in the current draft, it's set at 1%, I think a reasonable number, but that could be de debated, um, that the, the um, and if it follows our SMC and our code for petitions, that then it would qualify, and the city council would then have to begin that, that mid-process, mid which would still follow all of these details here. Um, if at the very end of the day there isn't a map adopted, uh, the, the way legal has expressed it to me uh, is that effectively what, what is in place would have to remain in place barring um, intervention by the courts. But I would much prefer more time, but unfortunately state law is pretty prescriptive in terms of the date which this has to be done. So um, I will do my best to answer questions if you got them, and I know we're limited on time, but I know uh, Mike Piccolo is also here and could answer questions too. Any questions for Councilman McEckhart? And full disclosure, a couple little tweaks in here were um, provided by uh, Chris as well. Any questions? I do. Council member? Question on the council member appointments. Yeah. In the, I think in the OPO council member process, the council members from those districts figure out the people from their district. Yes. And which is, I'm wondering if you're open to that, because I think that works well. And if they can't agree, then their person is not on the commission. So they, they have an incentive to figure out, as opposed to, I'm just thinking, 
in a situation you might be familiar with where the majority of council doesn't match uh, what that district wants. And so if it's the four council members, yeah. uh, you might be frustrated. And so your, your suggestion that the, the, the council members from that district would make the choice? For the one from their district. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly um, open to that. I think there's some language in the OPO. Yeah. We, can, we can talk more about that. And then I should too mention, and again, my, my whole goal is trying to, to create distance between any elected, mayor, council, from, from this process. And so uh, putting it in the hands of the plan commission uh, just to do, and I'm trying not to put any work on them, but just to vet, make sure they meet these qualifications that are in here. Uh, they can kind of check that box, say yes, they meet these qualifications. And then again, if the, the, the appointees cannot agree on that non-voting chair, again, this happened at the county, uh, rather than this body or, or another elected body getting involved in that, it would go to the plan commission, which is independent from us, uh, to, to choose that non-voting chair. So just trying to just depoliticize as much as, as, as the law allows uh, effectively. So put that out there too. Is there a second sponsor? Great. Uh, where do the three members appointed by the mayor, where do those come from? So are those citywide? And, and it, yeah, so it would, well, no, they would be by, by council district okay. uh, as well. Okay. And so the idea too is that we would also, the entire community would know who's applied uh, because again, the plan commission would collect all applications and then the mayor would choose from those, the council would choose from those applications that have gone through that vetting process. Okay, thanks. Just, is there, so with this last round, and one of the challenges this, I think I've mentioned before, is that we do it every 10 years, so it's guaranteed that none of us will yes. be there, and we're lucky to have Mr. Piccolo, who had actually been through it once, um, but even he had to kind of dust off the book, I'm sure. Um, so the last round, you know, the mayor picked the three and the council, so it, I'm just wondering what problem you're trying to solve on that piece. I'm not saying I'm against your thing, but, um, but she picked the three. We agreed to the three that she picked. I will, so I'll, my, here's my argument. At the state level, at the county level, it's partisan. It's, it's very partisan. And the, the two sides, effectively, they choose. Uh, there isn't, there is no, no one to veto their choice. So they get to pick who, who they want. And at the city level, we are nonpartisan uh, for a good reason. And the, the, the division here really is the branches. And so it's really the legislative and the executive. And so to me, it makes sense that those two sides pick uh, and, and get to pick their, their best and brightest and you know, who it is they, they want most to, to serve in this position. Um, I, the re and the reason it's seven is simply out of just the numbers. Uh, I would have preferred five. That is what the, the county does and, and uh, what the state has done, but just with three districts and trying to make sure that they're each represented, uh, seven made uh, more sense. So we went that direction. Um, but is there a reason why, like, three is not, you know, one for each district? Yeah. Then you wouldn't need an unelected chair if it was just three people. Well, I mean, the, the, the unelected chair is the person who basically leads the, the process, and, you know, so they can they can... Uh, intervene their opinions, but they don't have a vote at the end of the day. But the idea is tr trying to match this as close as possible with the existing state process or the county process that has that non-voting chair to, to lead the, um, the effort. And my other question is, I think you have some language about what defines a contiguous community and what defines a community yeah. of interest. Do you have neighborhood councils? Are they one of your is that in I, your piece or not? I, I think it's up to interpretation. Um, I mean, it says that uh, to the extent possible, the council district boundaries shall preserve existing communities of related and mutual interest, including shared cultural, social, or economic characteristics. I, I tried not to deviate from the state law. So I tried to keep it as tight as possible with state law, and I think that that is covered under that. But provision. didn't, on the contiguous, didn't you add some things, bridges or something like that, beyond the state law? I'm just wondering, if we're going to sort of customize for our particular city. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if that was. Maybe it's a previous version. I don't know. Was that, is that something that you added, Chris, or I'm wondering if that was Mike? No, it was, in, it was in your original. Okay. Uh, the, the bridges and natural barriers. Okay. So, um, mm -hmm. I am not entirely sure. Uh, I thought that came from state law, but if that's not state law, then we can no. discuss that. Okay. So, okay. And I, again, I'm, 
super interested in discussing. I do mm -hmm. like the idea of maybe since Spokane is so built on its neighborhood councils, just putting mm -hmm. putting okay. that in and saying, yep, yeah, that is a community event or something. Okay. But just worth discussing. Yeah. All right. Phone. Yeah, I was wondering why there's a lot here. I think the timelines are great. Like that was a big problem that we had was the timelines and yeah. starting late with the pointing and stuff. So I think the timelines make a lot of sense. Um, I was just wondering why the plan commission over other commissions that we have. Why not human rights commission? Why not um, well, sub, uh, the equity subcommittee? Why? Why the plan? Sure. Commission? My my thinking on the plan commission is that's that's where we go for uh, like naming, you know, parks and plazas and things like well, not parks per se, park board, but mm -hmm. plazas and, and things of that nature. You know, they they um, review those uh, street name changes, stuff like that. And so it just seemed to me like pro from a process perspective, this is something that they can handle really well. Um, and they're all kind of, I think, administrative in, in how they think. And so it, to me, that just made sense, but that certainly opened other ideas we can we can discuss and, and have we gone to the planning commission to see if this is a task they would like or i've i've spoken very briefly with spencer um but there has not been a, a comprehensive discussion yet what what other outreach has been done for this process sent it out to every single uh neighborhood every member of the community assembly every individual who contacted us last year on regardless of their their stance um that we had in our email list uh, uh asking for feedback i've um brought it up at a couple neighborhoods for feedback as well as uh, it was mentioned at community assembly, I believe, but the, um, the feedback so far, I mean, there, there's been some who just questions, you know, I mean, do we need this aspect? Do we need that? I would say largely folks, uh, you know, have generally been supportive. Um, but again, it's been just uh, a lot of kind of varied feedback, but, but nobody's outright said like, this is wrong or this, this aspect of it is wrong. They might just, just have some overall, you know, just not quite sure. So. All right. Is this one that would also go to the equity subcommittee then too? It can it can go to any committee you'd like. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Cat Hart. Yeah. We are going to move on, and we're going to have the update from Michelle Murray on the uh, small business awards. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is just um, we put out the small business awards at the beginning of this year and we um, awarded about 1.3 million, but then we extended the application to include parameters of increased expenses during COVID. And so we are asking to formalize the additional, after the extension of another $710,000 in awards to the um, agencies that are, businesses that are located in the packet. Great. Any questions? Super excited about the awards and going to small businesses in the community. Hey, this is the guy. <laughs> Kudos okay. to you. Thank He's you. He's done a great uh, job. Council Member Stratton and Wilkerson. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Next, we're going to do slow permit fees. And that's Tammy. We're going to be another round, or is that the last round? One more. That's just an extension of. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, and Mr. Dahl, is he coming on up as well? Yes. Um, right. Good afternoon. Tammy Palmquist, Development Services mm -hmm. Center. Um, I brought Lance because it does affect the fire <coughs> department as well. Um, so we were here a couple months ago for PIES committee and um, wanted to touch base with you again. Uh, in the time that I submitted, submitted or that we submitted this for the agenda, we've had, had 50 more permits. So we are up to 192 year to date, um, as opposed to the 143 when this was submitted two weeks ago. Um, so you can see that this is not slowing down. Uh, so it's working. The plan is working for everyone else, not for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, people are getting more solar um, systems attached to their homes and businesses. So yes, for the state, it is working. Um, for our departments, it's, it's becoming a little bit difficult. Um, so these are all permits that we still review, we still provide plan review on, 
and we still do inspections. A lot of these do take multiple inspections. Um, they are installed incorrectly or um, we inspect them at different points. We inspect the electrical. Uh, the thing that we're seeing now is that people are installing the battery systems in their garages, so we're having to also inspect those. Uh, since those are tied to the solar array, those again are not getting charged. Uh, so we've included some preliminary numbers. We've come up with some fees um, for, your, to, for you to review and we would like some input on that as well. We wanted to touch base with um, you and see if you heard anything back from the sustainability of how that was originally um, the percentage of clean renewable energy. Uh, yeah, well I can give you a little update as uh, an example of the human condition. They've been bogged down in procedural issues that, so they have not given us anything uh, officially. Okay. Um, I think I was reading over it again today and I, I mean my sense and my recollection is the intent is that for half the energy used in Washington that 50 percent of it be derived from uh, renewable sources. Um, there's a the distinction and the kind of discussion that we had back and forth for other people who weren't on our email list is that the energy that's produced in Washington state just produced not used but produced is highly uh, renewable if you count hydroelectric which mm -hmm. I do but the actual energy usage is, is not at this point. I don't think it comes close to that. Um, but um, that was the intent. I also asked you and you sent me some finances of what the reserves were and the financial condition of your department, not fire, but your department. It was a little not helpful, not based on you, because they included future retirement costs of employees that are essentially going to be paid by future uh, payroll yes, that we don't have and so it's, it's skewed it in a way I'm really looking more for that just my update request which I haven't given to you but is to get the cash reserves in your department uh, not the the retirement piece is pretty much a wash I understand that since you're a, uh, an enterprise fund that the accounting is a little different. But what I really want to know is what the cash is on that. I'm trying to get a sense of that. And based on your presentation materials today, you had foregone revenue, but I'm really more interested in out-of-pocket costs for you and FIRE, because that's the, the, there's a difference to me. Like if you're paying people to go do that, then, and you have to, um, absorb that within your departmental budget, that's one thing, as opposed to what the money that you get. Now, it might be the same, I don't know, but the way, it wasn't written that way, so it wasn't quite clear to me. Um, so, being an enterprise fund, yes, our revenues are what pays our employees to do the work, so uh, we have plan reviewers that are doing the plan review on these permits, um, and then I have inspectors going out in the field inspecting the installation mm -hmm. of these. And so they are absorbing those additional inspections into their daily inspection um, routes. And yeah, but I, I wasn't quite getting a cost at, because sometimes, at least in the past when I've dealt with your department, something doesn't, the fee is the fee. Oh, like a per se hourly rate yeah, the, of those employees? Yeah, or something because sometimes the fee is the fee that we set and we have some creative fees, but it doesn't cost as much to achieve that as the fee that is collected. Sure, There's I'll a work delta. with accounting to get So I'm trying numbers. to get the cost and try to understand the scope of your Lance issue. Lance may have a better idea when it comes to that. For fire, when you look at our flat fee proposal, so there's a couple proposals there. The upper one uh, on revenue potentially lost is based on our current revenue of taking our municipal code chart A out of the fire department and then producing that revenue based on right sizing the solar permits. And our flat fee proposal and our, uh, is pretty close to bare bones on what it costs for the fire department to go out and do those inspections. So in 605 permits for solar last year, we see about a 50 to 58% reinspection rate. So you're looking at about 900 trips out there. And so when you perform that against an FTE requirement for the year, an inspector can do somewhere around 1,100 to 1,200 inspections a year. Um, I've, I've programmed out about uh, 
1100, 1037, somewhere in there. It depends on the inspector, the district, how much vacation time and stuff they have. So I'm looking at about two thirds of an FTE just for, just for solar. And so when I'm sending those guys out doing solar inspections, because they're a construction related inspection, those have to be done when they're done, right? They have to be inspected when they're done. So what do we push off? We push off multifamily inspections. We push off commercial building inspections. We push off other safety inspections to do these solar. So that means, you know, at the end of the year, if I'm trying to get 1,625 uh, multifamily buildings inspected, maybe I don't get through all those in an annual cycle because I'm doing, I'm doing unpermitted work. Just quick question: uh, Is there is there still uh, uh, some some work going on or an effort to to seek out kind of that retroactive sprinkling policies? And if so, is there a lot of time and effort being spent on that that could be focused on on some of these other things? No. Okay. No, that's that's all high level work between the chief and I and 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 council. If we're ever going to retroactive anything, the only thing coming in the 2021 code when you talk retroactive sprinklers and it's already been adopted by the state is high rises. So high rises that meet the new state uh, 2021 code requirements will be retroactively sprinkled. I'm working with uh, the DSC to send out those letters in June after it's formally adopted on what their timeline is to sprinkle those buildings, but it only affects high rises. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. And I have Councilmember Bingle and Stratton sponsoring. All right. Uh, last one we're going to be looking at is the update to the Shrek interlocal agreement. And uh, it says Mrs. Schaefer, but you two can come on down. Good afternoon, Council. Thank okay. you for having me, Councilmember Wilkerson. Uh, so we are here to today to talk about we have a interlocal agreement already signed. We signed that back in October when we moved our fire dispatch to Shrek. Uh, we are waiting on the service level agreement. There are some things that the county needs to get through in order to accomplish that and uh, get to a position where council is comfortable looking at that and signing that. So in the interim, what Shrek has done is they've asked us to modify the interlocal agreement. It's a pretty brief statement. And basically what it does is it allows us the time to contact the county and have the county do what we're asking them to do, or at least get an answer what they're going to do before we have to start paying those administrative costs. Um, going along with that, we have had conversations with the county the county administrator on a couple occasions asking him, advising him what we are requesting. We haven't got an answer back, so I will draft a letter and send it to the county to ask them to um, comply with the ordinance that was passed last year, and hopefully we'll get a, an answer sooner rather than later. Is that the, que uh, the question about board membership? Yes. And yes. we still haven't heard anything on we that? We still haven't heard anything. Now, last time we came before the council, what, four weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, they didn't. They were not gonna have a Board of County Commissioners meeting for two or three weeks. So we knew we were gonna be about four weeks out before they could even have an opportunity to act. So, but we don't have information one way or the other what their, what their preference is. Council so, President. So my concern is that we have not given them, I mean, we passed this in October, we knew that we needed to do that, that we have not given them anything in writing saying this is, what we need, we first essentially wanted to replace the city administrator position with um, a designated person from council, and then the fire and the police chief would still be on it from the administration. And then they came to us and said, hey, could you keep the city administrator, but we'll give you potentially an ex officio position, non-voting, but a board member entitled to know everything. I said, well, that's fine, but I don't feel like we've actually sent them. Here's the language for your charter that we would need to do it. So that, that is my concern because when I talked to their administrator, he was like, oh, I, I don't know. No one's really given me anything. I mean, I feel like he has talked to you because I know he has, but, but it seems like we need to be way more proactive. And if this is our top priority and has been since October, I'm, a, I'm frustrated that we haven't 
just giving them, hey, this is what we're looking for, and, and reaching out to maybe county commissioners who might be willing to sponsor it, because that's kind of what he told me, is that, well, no county commissioner has given me any direction. So that's, I'm hoping that we'll go to be proactive as opposed to hoping that they'll figure it out. Sure, I understand that. But the conversation we have had, uh, they've kind of expressed their, their interest, and we got to the one position, a non-voting position. We also got, we also got them to include uh, the other two issues that were in the ordinance. So I, I agree we need to follow up with, with the county. We'll send out that letter, but we have had ongoing conversations. It's only been the last couple of weeks where we really haven't gotten any response back. And I think part of that is because the county commissioners have not been available. So we, we will follow up. But this protects us. The, the amendment we're asking you to approve protects us. We will not be paying that admin fee in, in the interim while we're uh, dealing with those issues. Otherwise, we are looking at possibly having the service level agreement revoked at some point in the near future, and we would be paying the admin fee for the entirety of 2023, and we do not want to do that. Any other questions? Council President, you, you not not for me. I have one thing before you adjourn the meeting. One small. Thing. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council President. One thing before we adjourn the meeting. Yeah. So, um, the uh, airport has arranged to bring a giant I beam out in front of the south end of the building uh, for us to go up and sign because we cannot attend the Thursday study session meeting of the topping ceremony, and they really want our engagement since we're there co-owners, and so I would just invite people to head up to um, the block facing River Park Square. It should be out there. I'm, I'm not sure Do you get a, a paintbrush or a Sharpie pen or how it, how it works, but please, uh, uh, airport director and CEO, uh, Mr. Crowder, is waiting for us. So. Great. With that, uh, FNA is adjourned. We'll be meeting again on May 15th. See you outside. Hey, Kyle.